All right, so welcome everybody to today's Mara Open House. Uh, during the next hour, maybe a little less, you'll be introduced to our School of Information and the Master of Archives and Records Administration, or MARA, degree. Uh, one of our students, Katie, is with me today to answer your questions about what it's like to be a student. Uh, so please hold your questions until the end and we'll have time for some Q&A and I'll also leave you with my email address in case you have questions that we can't get to. So I'm Dr. Pat Franks up there at the top and uh, I'm the MARA program coordinator but I'll also be your uh, advisor if you're in the program for the duration of your time in the program so we can talk about things like courses you're taking and schedule you can handle that type of thing. Uh, below me uh, to the right there is Dr. Sandra Hirsch. She's our director of the iSchool. She's very progressive, really go get her. And uh, she holds meetings with students once a semester at least. Uh, below her is Dr. Linda Main. She's the associate director and she's the one who uh, makes decisions on um, uh, things like course offerings, and uh, she also uh, jumps in when uh, uh, we have questions that we don't know how to answer. So she really is the person working behind the scenes to make everything go really smoothly. And then down at the bottom on the right is Sheila Gertrude. And uh, if you are, uh, if you apply and are accepted to our program, you immediately hear from Sheila. Uh, she's what we call an online student advisor. So she helps with things like forms and registration and uh, if you're taking electives, permission numbers, things like that. Our primary faculty, and we have other uh, faculty members as well, but uh, primarily you're going to learn from uh, Dr. Lisa Dalby, uh, who is a, a full-time lecturer. Uh, she is a certified records manager and an information governance professional. Uh, also from Jason Kaltenbacher, who's a certified records manager, and from Joshua Zimmerman, who is a, a certified archivist. And uh, each of them teach different courses, so you'll uh, meet several of them. Uh, in fact, two in the fall, should you take the two courses we recommend. And if you decide to take three, you'll add Joshua's down there on the bottom, so you would meet all three in the fall. Uh, and this is Katie. And uh, right now I'm going to let Katie introduce herself and then uh, she's going to explain a little bit about the online resources that we have and you'll learn that she's responsible for a number of these. So uh, Katie, why don't you take the mic and just let me know when you want me to move the slide ahead. All right. Hi everyone, I'm Katie. Uh, I've been in the program three years. This is my last semester. So um, I'm well-versed in uh, the MARA program, and I love everything about it. It's been such a wonderful experience, and I'm very sad to go. So, um, Pat, if you wanna go to the next slide. Um, I will be talking about all our, our information online and our social media. So, this is our new website. We've just updated it this past uh, semester, and it is a portal to learn more information about our program. Uh, we have an, a specific page that gives you the opportunity to download our brochure. You can review our job trends. Uh, we put out a job analysis report every year uh, in the fall. And on the site, this is where you'll be able to uh, read about it and any other information regarding admission requirements, fees, and learning outcomes. Uh, also under the MARA tab on our website, you can visit student experience, which gives you 10 reasons to enroll in MARA, and you can learn how to apply to our program and what life is like after MARA. Uh, you also have a chance to access our blog. So we have six blogs throughout all of SGSU. Uh, the most helpful for MARA is the Mara blog and this blog, the iStudent blog. The iSchool blog, uh, iStudent blog, provides important information and resources, useful advice for both Mara and MLIS students. Uh, their posts are about courses, career pathways, online learning, time management, student groups, conference and conferences, and financial aid. It's such a useful tool for students during the program. 
Uh, next slide. Okay, so we'll be talking about social media. Uh, I have been working really hard on promoting our program through Facebook and Twitter and our Mara blog. So, next slide. All right, so this is our, uh, this is one of our blogs. Uh, it's our Spotlight series, which is, um, focuses on a student that is either current or alumni, and sometimes it has to do with when they went to an ARMA chapter meeting, what that's like, or we have a blog post about someone who uh, took the CRM exam. Um, but this, this blog keeps you up to date on archives and records in the news, and you can learn about students and alumni through the Spotlight series. And um, I also do a uh, post on like different careers in the archives and records management. Right now I'm working on a post about a fashion archivist. So we have a lot of interesting posts that go up and it also keeps you up to date on news because I like to make sure we're current and, and talking about what's in the news. Uh, next slide. This is our Facebook page. Uh, it's an opportunity to act, interact with more students. Uh, it will let you, I'll let you know when blog posts are up, when webinars are going on, um, or going to happen. And it's a place that you can post articles and interact as well. Uh, or even if you have questions, it's a great place for our students to communicate with each other. Next slide. So we also have a Second Life program called the, it's the Virtual Center for Archives and Records Administration, also known as VACARA. Uh, this is an interactive site and it's open to anyone who wants to join. VACARA hosts virtual world events such as the VWP, VPE exhibit, which is coming up soon, as you can see that it's highlighted in purple. Um, and that's a completely virtual conference about the best practices in education. And Vicara is such a great learning experience. Uh, and through their blog, you'll find highlights on lectures and events. And you can also check out their new website to find out more information. There's a brand new website up. Um, but this blog gives you a lot more insight to what Vicara does. Next slide. I'm very excited about this webinar. So we have guest lectures. Um, how many times uh, a semester? Usually two a semester. Two a semester. Uh, this one I've been working on. This is, um, my goal is to introduce different types of jobs in the records and administration fields, archives field. And uh, I have uh, immersed myself in zoo life now. <laughs> And uh, we have a curator of husbandry and records, Matt S Segan, um, who will be talking, and Josh Cortrew, who is a training manager at Species 360 that uh, is, is the program that their records management is on. So all of the zoos, they work through this program through Species 360. So this is a great lecture um, that we'll be having March 26, um, just to learn about a different version of records and administration and archives. So next slide. Okay. So also, uh, since we have webinars, if you can't make them, we do have them online um, at this website. And if uh, if you want to see some of our packs past lectures and what they've been about. Uh, this is the page to go to to access those. Uh, listening to past webinars can give you an idea of what careers are like and it's just a great way to learn more. I think that's it. Okay, thank you, Katie. Yeah. Uh, you are always welcome to attend our webinars whether or not you're a student. So if you go to search on webcasts or webinars, uh, SJSUI school and uh, you can register for those you don't you actually don't have to register uh, what you do is see the link to the session it'll be held in zoom 
just like this one. And uh, on the day of the presentation, just feel free to join us. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about the MARA program. When it was first developed, and that was uh, quite some time ago, uh, we're celebrating our 10th anniversary this academic year. Uh, the individuals who created it uh, took a look at uh, ARMA core competencies and Society of American Archivists guidelines for graduate programs, thinking that we really should be combining uh, the skills for both archives and records since record keeping is a continuum uh, from creation through whatever you do with disposition or permanent uh, retention. Uh, and we also looked at the certification examinations for uh, certified records managers and for certified archivists and made sure that our curriculum covered all of that. Well, of course, over the years, uh, things have changed. And uh, a few years ago, I believe uh, it was maybe, what, 2015, 2016, uh, was the first time that there was an exam for information governance professional. And uh, I sat for the very first exam as a way to figure out what the heck was going to be in it, because we were going to launch our very first course uh, in information governance uh, right as soon as that exam came out. And so we are sure that within our curriculum, we cover the uh, information that you need also uh, to prepare yourself for uh, the exam for an information governance professional. Uh, we uh, took our curriculum and uh, talked to the people at the ICRM, the Institute for Certifying uh, Records uh, Analysts and Records Managers, and uh, had them review it and worked out an agreement whereby if you graduate from the MAR program, you automatically are given credits for parts one through five of the six part exam. The six part is a case study. Uh, but if you uh, graduate from the program and have either work experience or take the internship course or an organizational consulting project course, uh, you would be prepared to submit a request to become a certified records analyst immediately, uh, or you could take the uh, sixth part of the exam to become a certified records manager. So uh, this agreement saved our students, I think, about $500 in exam fees and a lot of time in preparing for those five different exams. And we've had a number of students take advantage of this, but we also have a lot of students that are in our program, they're already certified records managers. Uh, we also uh, presented our curriculum to the Academy of Certified Archivists uh, because we contend that we are preparing you for both. So we wanted to be sure uh, that's what we're really doing. And uh, their exam committee took a look at all of our courses. We have 11. One of them is either an internship or organizational consulting project. So that never has uh, consistent uh, learning outcomes because all situations are different. However, our 10 uh, courses that have content, their lecture courses, uh, were all pre-approved by the ACA. So as students, if you ever wanted to sit for the uh, examination to be a certified archivist, uh, you are well prepared after taking your courses in order to sit for that examination as well. They have only one exam, it's 100 uh, questions, and so uh, they do not, of course, give credit for that, but they do pre-approve you as having been prepared to sit for it. Um, I mentioned learning outcomes uh, and uh, how we looked at uh, all of those different areas to create a framework upon which to build our courses. And first we took a look at what, what do we really want our students to be prepared to do by the time they graduate and how could we put that into uh, 10 simple statements that we can make that you understand this is what you need to do. And at the end of it, you're going to be able to prove that you can do that. So here are the 10. Uh, they're called Program Learning Outcomes by the University and we call them our core competencies. Uh, they, if you finish all of these courses, you are well prepared to uh, provide evidence that you have uh, mastered all of those core competencies. And you see the 11 courses I mentioned here down at the bottom is the uh, professional experience or organizational consulting project, one or the other. Uh, all of the rest of them are required. 
Uh, the uh, last one where I mentioned the organizational consulting project or internship, if there's a reason that your uh, employer uh, does not allow you to participate in something like this, we can uh, substitute a fourth elective for you. So uh, there is a way that you can request a substitution for that. But the rest of the courses uh, prepare you very well for careers uh, in archives records and information governance. I, I mentioned uh, asking you to prove that you've mastered the core competencies. Well, you do that by completing a course, uh, which is the MAR 289, it's an e-portfolio course. Uh, we have the same requirement in our MLIS program as well. This is an example of Rachel's from, I think it was last spring. Uh, what she did was use WordPress uh, and uh, she created her e-portfolio by providing an introduction to it. And then you see the term competencies here. If you clicked on that on her real site, you would see each one of those 10 competency statements I mentioned, but each one of them would be expanded upon to explain what she believes that means, how she's mastered it, how she's going to use what she's learned through that competency in the future, and the evidence that she can provide. And it's usually two or three activities that have been created or assignments. So it could be very substantial discussions that she engaged in, but it also should be uh, written assignments, uh, group projects, uh, presentations that she's made. And there were even cases where students have prepared something at work. Uh, that satisfied uh, as evidence for one of the core competencies. So you can certainly look to an internship or a work experience for evidence of some of these competencies as well. And then uh, she prepared a conclusion. The affirmation just means she's stating this was all of her work. Uh, this is, a, as I said, a course itself, and it's a very rigorous one. Uh, but students say that the opportunity to go back and reflect on all they've learned throughout the program helps them better position themselves now to put together uh, a, either a actual portfolio for a, a job they may be seeking or to update their resume uh, or to use in some other way. So now the courses themselves. Well, if you begin the program in the fall, you see that the first course you would take would be uh, MAR 200 and 204. Now, this is a recommendation for two courses each semester and one in each of two summers in order to finish in less than three years. And I believe it's about 75% of uh, students, according to a recent survey, complete within the three years. Uh, some students, uh, do go a little faster and finish a few years, but uh, not, not um, faster than that. Uh, and that's because, as you see on the spring, our courses are only offered once a year, either fall or spring, so you have to be very careful in how you prepare your schedule to be sure that you complete the courses uh, in a uh, timely manner. You do have up to seven years to complete the program. After seven years, the first courses you finish falls off because they're too old. And so at that point, it's very difficult to try to take those plus whatever else you need to complete the program. So you really need to get it done within uh, those seven years. Uh, if you'd like, as I said, to take uh, more than two courses a semester, that's when you contact me and we work out what's the best third course for you to take. Uh, I don't believe I've ever had anyone take four courses, but I have had a number of students take three. Uh, you can also take courses in the summer, but MAR courses are not offered in the summer except for electives. Our required courses are not. So. Uh, any electives, MLIS electives, or MARA one and two credit courses that you take in the summer can be used as your elective credit. So that brings me to what is the elective credit? Well, we had 11 courses you must take in MARA. So uh, there you've got 33 units uh, of uh, credit, uh, but our program is 42. So another nine units of credit must be earned somewhere. And most often it's by students taking three, three credit courses that are offered through the MLIS program that they think are really interesting. We have a MARA program um, advisory committee that reviews every student request for an elective to approve, in addition to our list or to reject that. And uh, we do not allow students to take 
courses that are not on the list, but we are very responsive in trying to understand why a request is made and to expand the list. So you'll see we have uh, maybe about 40 uh, right now options that you can select from. Now, uh, we have something uh, new as well. When you graduate with the MAR degree, you can also, at that time, request an advanced certificate in strategic management of digital assets and services. That certificate is a certificate from the school. Uh, it is not another degree, and it's not a certification, but it is a, a certificate verifying that you've taken three courses in one of these three pathways. You can only do one. Uh, it could be digital asset management, it could be information governance, assurance, and security, or it could be data analytics and data-driven decision making. The easiest one for our students to achieve is the information governance, assurance, and security one. Uh, that's because you already have two required courses uh, within this certificate uh, is information governance and information assurance. And then by adding just an elective in cybersecurity, you'll be able to graduate with the MARA degree and a certificate uh, in uh, digital assets. So uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about how a MARA course works. Uh, as I mentioned, we're recommending for students starting in the fall two courses. One is MAR 200. Uh, this, as you see there, is ACA pre-approved. Uh, but uh, this is a course that uh, is our writing course. Every program has to have one writing course, so this is the one. Uh, that's where you're introduced to the APA style manual for writing, for references, and text citations, and that. And, but it's also the one that introduces you to our view of the combination of um, archives, records, information governance, everything that goes into uh, what would be what we call the record keeping profession. Jason Kaltenbacher teaches a second course that's offered in the fall is record and record keeping professions. Uh, he also takes the viewpoint of uh, looking at, from a management view, how you would manage uh, either records or archival institutions or programs. And uh, he has, uh, as Lisa does, a lot of experience uh, in the uh, uh, real world. Uh, they both worked for a number of uh, companies, Jason as a consultant and then also as a records manager uh, uh, at Nike, actually. And Lisa still is very involved in her consulting work. Uh, so they make sure that you have everything you need that really uh, keeps you up to date on what is happening uh, in the field. Now this is an example of course I teach. In fact, I'm, I'm teaching it right now to MAR students, so it's called MAR 283. <laughs> uh, but it's uh, Enterprise Content Management and Digital Preservation. And uh, the way it's set up is we use a Canvas learning management system. Within there we set up modules uh, for each week. Uh, you see an expanded module for the very first week. Uh, in there, it kind of goes in order, so it's easy to follow. Uh, you'll have lectures, you'll have uh, readings, you'll have links to uh, sites uh, online that we think you should be looking at. Uh, we all include a video, at least in uh, one of our sections in each module, so uh, you will have that interaction there. We also always have discussions, and uh, in this course, I have hands-on activities, because in this one, um, we use Office 365 and SharePoint for the first half of the course to create SharePoint sites. And then in the second half of the course, we use Preservica. I'm not sure if you are familiar with that. It's a digital repository, um, online uh, uh, software and service uh, that uh, powers a lot of uh, very important uh, archives and digital uh, repositories right now. Uh, and so our students uh, have the opportunity to create collections and make them 
uh, accessible through universal access. It's uh, WordPress that we use. So anyway, this is what this looks like. We never require you to be in one place at a certain time. Uh, what we give you is that week within which to get your work done. Uh, I kind of require all of my students by Thursday night to do an initial post so that we really have a discussion, try to prevent all of them from coming in on Sunday right before the mod closes. That really isn't helpful to anyone. Uh, but other than that, they have the entire week to do the activities that uh, are assigned in the readings. Now, students also have the ability to create Zoom sessions just like the one you're in. So if we get into group assignments, which we do in the second half of this course, uh, they will be setting up their own Zoom sessions if they want to get together and meet that way. So this is something Katie worked on, but I grabbed a few of the stats from uh, her work. What she did uh, for the last two years in the fall was put together a jobs analysis. Uh, I took a look at a number of uh, job postings for a certain specific period of time. Last year it was between August 20 and October 31st and uh, evaluated 176 unique jobs. Uh, and you'll see how they were uh, break out into archival or archives and records combined or records management or information governance and are now records and information governance combined. Uh, when we started um, putting information governance on there as something to add, a few years ago um, there was 1% and then it grew to 3%. Now we're up to 7% plus a three, another 3% 3 that is combined with records. So we're seeing movement uh, in more uh, job postings for the field information governance. Some of the statistics. Uh, uh, we have five to 10 uh, years of experience for a lot of the jobs within the RIM and IG field, uh, but that doesn't mean that you won't be employed if you don't have that experience. But it, it, it is a good reason uh, to emphasize that if you don't have the experience, volunteer, get into internships, things like that. Uh, we also uh, took a look at the educational requirements and about 25% 24% actually asked for a uh, master's degree. There was a very small percentage that asked for a doctorate, uh, a number that asked for bachelors. Uh, but the thing to remember here is that the more qualified you are, the more likely you're the one that's going to be offered the position if there are a group of you looking for the same type of job. Uh, also, we have 26% of the openings are in companies that have 100 to 500 employees, and you could see the rest of the breakdown. There's still over 20% in companies with 1,000 to 7,500 employees as well, so it's a little uh, medium size there. Uh, we also have 20% of openings in education, government, and nonprofits. So uh, one of the presentations that we had not too long ago was by a number of people that worked in archives and state government. And uh, that's in our webinar archives there. You can go back and listen to what they have to say about that. Um, now salaries, this is from a salary wizard that we found and it's just kind of a breakdown and it changes, it morphs. This was for records manager. If you looked for the salary wizard and look for archives or information governance, you'll see other figures. Uh, but this is just one that, that I grabbed to put in here. Uh, there's a median salary, but you know, of course, that uh, people are paid less and more depending on your experience as well as your education. And uh, I, I can't emphasize enough uh, your activities as well, uh, whether it's in professional associations or uh, volunteer work or something like Katie's doing where she's just had so much experience working with a lot of people uh, in her position as a graduate student assistant. So uh, I'm coming to the end of why, uh, if you decide that you want this type of degree, would you choose San Jose's MARA program? Uh, we conduct surveys, uh, and according to the students that respond to those surveys, uh, they selected and are pleased with the program. In fact, the last several years, we have 100% of the respondents that would recommend the program to others uh, based on the quality faculty, the program itself, the technology, but most of all, 
uh, the community of learners. Uh, the students that we have in our programs are amazing. Whether they have experience in the field or not, they have so much uh, life experience and work experience that they bring uh, to the program and to the classes that everyone learns from one another. Uh, and then also opportunities to learn from the experts through our guest lecture series, just like the one uh, that Katie uh, helped set up for us on uh, uh, zoos uh, and aquariums, which I am so eager to uh, attend, and you're welcome to attend, uh, so think about that. Uh, and also Second Life student uh, uh, presentations and guest lectures in there. We had some amazing ones on artificial intelligence. In fact, one of the presenters um, showed how she developed an app in Second Life that she is now moving to commercial product outside of Second Life to be used on, uh, on um, smartphones. So uh, we get a lot of uh, really great input from people in the field. Uh, the third reason, though, is our cost. We have been steady since I came into this program when it was first launched, $474 per unit. Uh, and uh, you pay only for what you take each semester, so you're not paying a uh, tuition fee uh, for the semester. You're just paying for the number of credits that you're enrolled in. And it's uh, less than 20000 as you see there, for the entire your master's degree regardless of how long it takes you. Now students uh, uh, can apply or prospective students can apply uh, up until June 1st. Um, you want to apply as, as soon as you decide that this is something for you. Uh, in order to be accepted you need a bachelor's degree with a 3.0 GPA minimum or any master's degree will do. And we have a number of students that already have one and uh, sometimes two other master's degrees. Um, if you do not have a 3.0 overall GPA, our um, admissions office computes the last 60 units of credit to see if your last 60 units uh, were uh, a 3.0 because sometimes we get off to a rocky start. If they were a 3.0, you will be accepted. But if neither is a 3.0, you still have the opportunity to uh, take courses at another accredited institution uh, and then bring up that GPA so that when you do apply, you'll have those extra transcripts that you can submit so that you can prove that your last 60 units of credits were a 3.0. Now you see here that the application period uh, ends on June 1st. Uh, it's closed on that date, so you want to get it in before the end of May. However, uh, if you do decide to apply to the program and you'd like to be considered for uh, one of our special scholarships, uh, you need to apply for that by May 1st. So you want to get the application in soon so that you uh, are a student that's been accepted so that uh, you can apply for one of the $1,422 uh, scholarships. That would cover one of your courses. Contact me directly through email. Uh, I want to thank you very much for attending 